This is episode 578 of the Rio Grande Foundation's Tipping Point New Mexico. I'm Paul Gessing. And I'm Wally Drangmeister. I'm president of the Rio Grande Foundation, New Mexico's free market think tank. You can find out more about the foundation at riograndefoundation.org. Wally, as we sit down here to record this, we are about, oh, nine days from the Signy die, uh, the end of the New Mexico legislative session, uh, 30 days. And, uh, you know, we're going to go through what seem to be the most impactful bills that are actually gaining momentum in the legislature. And it's not a surprise to us, uh, a lot of the bills that we're going to talk about. And uh, we've talked about some of them before, but... Uh, There was a football coach uh, who essentially said one time in a press conference, we knew who they said they were, and I don't know what that means, but basically we knew where things were going in a 30-day session. Uh, Guns have been a huge part of the the, the left-wing push, but there's been a few important economic issues Nothing really positive to date. We're going to talk briefly about where uh, we might see this tax bill heading. But uh, first and foremost, HB 41, uh, that was passed on the House floor over the weekend. This is the so-called clean fuel standard. It uh, passed 36 to 33. This is, oh, I think the third attempt the legislature's made uh, to get this passed. This has the governor's support. In years past, they've been a little more specific with regard to what exactly would be done. Uh, This one passes the buck to the Environmental Improvement Board, the unelected body uh, appointed by the governor. Uh, But ultimately, uh, there are concerns, justifiable concerns about the impact of this on gas prices. There's tax credits that have managed to appeal to enough of the so-called major oil and gas companies, uh, even P&M, because they can then take credits against their uh, CO2 emitting activities. So, you know, essentially this is getting towards Christmas tree bill territory. Um, And like I said, uh, it passed 36-33, which does mean that several Democrats opposed it, but um, it did pass. And uh, it's looking like it will likely be able to pass through the Senate. You know, you never know, but uh, that's the first and biggest bill that we've talked about pretty much consistently. Yes, and, you know, having those credits in there, Paul, uh, you know, I will set aside for a minute whether those are are a good thing. Uh, That might make things a little easier for New Mexico. One of the things that we talked about was that New Mexico is such a small market, and if you have different formulations required for that. It's it's not clear that refineries would be able or willing to completely reformulate their gasoline. But if you can just keep doing what you're doing, uh, take advantage of, uh, of a credit somehow to get through that, maybe it would make things better. But the, the, the big answer is we don't know. And, you know, anytime there's been these uh, external... Uh, items. It's like, okay, well, you don't really need to do it, but you you can do it this other way. Uh, Once you go back and look at it at the end of the day, uh, uh, can you really even tell what's happened? It certainly has not been to this point in uh, America, a great environmental move to have these things go that way. So, Yeah, um, I would add a couple things. One is that uh, tax credits may reduce the negative impact of the bill, but there's still a form of subsidy and you know there there are tax credits that oh you know as long as you're doing a real tax credit not a refundable tax credit which i'm pretty positive these are refundable uh the difference being that a traditional tax credit is a credit against actual taxes paid a refundable tax credit is much more of a subsidy that's the way the film so-called tax credits work. That's the way the child care tax credit passed last session uh, operates. That's the way, uh, quite frankly, most tax credits nowadays work because you really enhance the so-called progressivity. You're you're creating much more of a handout for the lower income levels uh, and just handing out government money or taxpayer dollars uh, 
depending on how you look at it. So uh, that's one aspect of this. And then because the technology, the specific mechanism for achieving these CO2 gains is not prescribed in the legislation, we're kind of left to guess and assume based on past efforts what that really means. Now, in the years past, it's basically prescribed ethanol as being Mm -hmm. the means of generating these uh, CO2 savings. By well, some estimates, the most unenvironmentally friendly fuel that's even out there. It's the exactly, worst, so. and it's just the same problem as you get with the electric vehicles. Is just because the bad thing CO two doesn't come out of the tailpipe doesn't mean that the processes along the way, electricity generation, mining in the case of EVs, ethanol production with. Uh, massive quantities of fertilizers, lost opportunity costs because of the cleared land. I mean, and I, massive energy to create. Yeah, and the, all well. those combines and, and tractors and the shipping and the processing, all those things come into play. But because of the way, uh, you know, and it's politically generated, of course, the uh, process uh, is not accounted for in terms of the carbon, just the whatever's coming out of the tailpipe. So it's. Uh, it, it's uh, like <laughs> some some bad math there. Let's just say that uh, it's uh, not necessarily accurate to say this is going to have a real positive impact on uh, CO2 emissions, if that's something you care about. Uh, but the gas price increase, uh, they say, and they repeatedly say, oh, this isn't going to increase gas prices. But uh, that remains hard to fathom. Uh, Data from Oregon says that their program does increase gas prices. Uh, Estimates are as high as 50 cents per gallon. And, uh, you know, ultimately, I think the advocates are just hoping that we don't notice it, no matter what the ultimate impact is uh, in terms, you know, because gas prices are volatile. You, you, go to a gas station or buy a gas station three times a week, and chances are they're going to have three different prices for gasoline, uh, and they're just hoping that that gets kind of uh, put into the bottom line and doesn't really have a noticeable impact. But when you go to a state that has one of these uh, policies in place, you tend to notice that they have higher gas prices. And California is the most obvious example, but uh, even Arizona and... uh, the big county there uh, where Phoenix Mar- is located. Maricopa. Maricopa, yeah. yeah. They have a special local policy. And, uh, you know, tack, uh, the in, the price of gasoline is much higher when you go down to Phoenix. Yeah, in, it is not that going to be that hard to figure out what happens. You know, we'll, you can look at the historical spread between oil price and delivered gasoline price and uh, – Take a look at that if if this thing passes and see what impact it d- does have. But you're right because uh, prices move around a lot. You could uh, put it in there. Uh, left also to the uh, environment department. Who knows? Is there going to be a phase in if prices go up? You know, you can do all sorts of things where we'll only be environmentally uh, friendly, assuming that this really is up until the point that. Consumers start to feel the pain, and then we might back it off a little. Is that possible? I don't know. So this is a uh, this in the in the words of uh, former Governor Bruce King. This is looks sounds like a box of Pandora's we're opening up here. We'll have to see how this all works out. Exactly. Um, now, in terms of the other bill that I would say is the most impactful uh, on your freedom, the paid family leave legislation. Uh, HB six had been kind of uh, garnering the headlines, shall we say. Uh, both of these are paid leave bills that are very, uh, uh, that are pretty much identical. Uh, last year, SB 11 was the one that got the traction because it passed through the Senate and uh, was only uh, killed in a House committee on the way through the House. Uh, HB 6 is held up in said committee. This is the House Commerce Committee, Uh, Again, that killed the previous iteration, SB 11, last year. SB 3 now is the Senate version, and that seems to be the one with the momentum. Uh, Over the weekend, I testified in Senate Finance Committee, 
Uh, and to his credit, uh, Senator George Munoz, chair of that committee, a Democrat, joined the Republicans and voted against SB3, but it passed through Senate finance uh, and to the floor of the Senate. So we shall see how quickly they want to schedule that for a vote and more importantly, uh, what they want to do in terms of trying to ram it through the House. Uh, you know, Javier Martinez, uh, to his credit, the speaker has been, I think, very fair in his approach. He's Nobody's going to confuse him with a moderate Democrat. Uh, Javier Martinez is a uh, ardent progressive. He's right up there with anybody, but uh, he has been somewhat reasonable in terms of his approach to uh, scheduling bills and pushing them through. If Senate, if House Commerce Committee is on the agenda for uh, SB three, assuming it makes its way off the house, uh, the Senate floor, then. Uh, you know, I think we're going to see the same thing that happened, whereas uh, that committee is going to kill the bill. But, Or maybe they've struck a deal with one of the members of that committee to get it through, uh, may, maybe making some alteration or doing something else to please that particular member. But uh, we're getting into brass tax time here on paid leave, and uh, that's where I see things heading. So uh, any thoughts on that? Well, just real quickly, you know, what does the bill do? It's uh, who pays, yeah. employers and employees pay, and how much a combined 1% split between them, roughly, you know, 55, 45, you know, 60, 40, something like that. And then how long do you pay before you actually get a benefit? Because this thing is, uh, it's, well, I was surprised to hear that the fund required is going to be a whole lot larger than the unemployment fund that exists in New Mexico. So this isn't a minor thing. And then the real question is, is once this thing starts to kick in, what is going to happen? You know, will, will the rates that they estimated keep it liquid or will we have to raise it, uh, uh, raise the amount instead of 1%? Is it going to have to be two or more? And so uh, these are all important questions. But what is not talked about as much, Paul, is that this applies to everybody. And if you're a three-person shop, this could be... This could be horrible from an administration point of view. And New Mexico is not good. You know, most other states, they'll exempt the smallest businesses. And usually there it's 50 or less. I think it's, I think they do have an exemption of five and below. For paying, but not for administering. Uh, So okay. here's the thing. I think for small businesses, uh, the payment part is going to pale compared to the administration, right. you know? And so if you have two employees and both of them are out on leave, that's it. You're done, you know, game over, but you right. have to hold a spot for them to come back. Right. So it's one of those that there's some things there that I don't think have been talked about sufficiently. And again, if New Mexico would uh, grow up and exempt businesses with 50 or less or heck 10 or less, I think they could uh, they could make these things a little more palatable. You know, we are getting to be where the administration required for small business is such that we don't have as many of them as we used to, and they keep making it harder and harder and harder to uh, start them and get it going. So we'll see what happens with this. But if this thing ends up being underfunded here in a few years, will that be the first time that government underestimated the cost of a benefit program? I don't think so. No, you're right. And, uh, of course, finding people, you don't have the easiest time finding, let alone uh, competent, but warm bodies off the street to fill these jobs. And then you have to uh, pay their unemployment expenses when you cut them loose to bring back the original person. It's a mess, and uh, the I love the Mimi Stewarts of the world. The you know Senator Mimi Stewart, one of the prime advocates for this, you know, spent her entire life in a government environment as a school teacher, uh, acting like she has some insight into the way small business operates in New Mexico, and saying that this is going to be good for small businesses. It. Uh, it's kind of like a the blind man and the elephant and uh, trying to judge what an elephant is by touching its tail or its trunk or its nose or some other aspect of the ele elephant. I mean, that's maybe a, a, a weird analogy, but uh, Mimi Stewart has no clue what 
businesses deal with on a day-to-day basis. And, uh, you know, maybe we need a, a provision that if you've never signed the front of a paycheck, uh, just the back of a paycheck, you can't vote on <laughs> all of these business-oriented provisions. That would be that would be one heck of, a, of an amendment. And uh, we're not talking about her her uh, housekeeper either. So uh, a couple other bills that uh, are moving. HB 133 would impose a variety of new regulations. This is kind of a kitchen sink bill. Uh, definitely, again, targeted at the small producers in oil and gas in New Mexico. Uh, it awaits action on the House floor. Uh, this does seem to be a pri- priority for the governor. Uh, and while the governor hasn't necessarily come after the industry uh, f- completely. Uh, she's definitely over the years tried to push smaller operators out of business in favor of bigger operators. Uh, you know, we'll see what shakes loose in terms of the oil and gas industry in this session, but definitely more action uh, geared towards attacking the industry. And uh, we sat down with uh, Jim Winchester of the Independent Petroleum Association of New Mexico for this week's interview. And uh, go check that out for a more detailed analysis of what's facing the oil and gas industry and why it's kind of uh, coming under attack more directly, despite record revenues. Uh, HB 129, we knew this was going to have a lot of gun, this session was going to have a lot of gun bills. Uh, this was the original, HB 129 was the original 14-day waiting period before purchase. Uh, that bill uh, passed the House floor on a, uh, you know, there's Democrat support, bipartisan opposition, uh, but it was a seven-day waiting period, so we'll be keeping an eye on that one. And uh, yeah, those are some of the bigger bills. We've got a few more to talk about, but uh, in terms of impactful legislation on the move, I think those four or five are uh, the ones to highlight right now. Yeah, Paul, and I did uh, find it very interesting that they moved it from 14 days to seven days. So, you know, it's one of those, uh, I guess, ostensibly the purpose for that, although they never even talk about the purpose for these things anymore. Uh, it's like, I think it's so that, uh, what, if you want to kill somebody, you need to plan ahead. You know, it can't be a crime of passion. It has to be premeditated. But keep in mind also, if you uh, plan to go hunting here in a couple of weeks and you uh, haven't planned ahead, uh, you might have to uh, uh, borrow a, a friend's uh, friend's gun because you might not be able to get one in time. And that's uh, really, do not quote me on this, assuming it's even legal to borrow a friend's gun to go uh, to Mexico. <laughs> Who knows where we'll come out of out after this session. So. Well, uh, that does play exactly into what I've, kind of concluding here uh, broadly is that uh, th- this legislative session, like so many before it, doesn't even address the real issues facing New Mexico. Uh, the economy uh, at this point, if we escape with a, a do-no-harm legislative session, will be ahead of the game. Uh, I suspect that harm will be done. Even with a $3.5 billion surplus, the legislators and the governor simply can't find it in themselves to alleviate the burdens and make New Mexico a more business-friendly state, whether that's taxes, regulations, whatever you may say. Uh, The gun issue is the way the governor has framed uh, everything, not crime. Uh, She claims that guns and eliminating guns will equal less crime, but That is really a hard uh, position to hold uh, competently. New Mexico does have a lot of guns, but the crime in New Mexico, uh, it's transcended and always been around. Uh, It's gotten worse in recent years, but it's been worse in previous years. Uh, There are plenty of states with much more liberal gun laws, and by liberal I mean uh, pro-Second Amendment gun laws, than New Mexico that have uh, minuscule amounts of crime uh, relative to us. Uh, I'll throw New Hampshire and Vermont out as two examples, uh, politically slightly different, but much more uh, limited in their approach to uh, 
going after guns and uh, very little crime. If we actually addressed crime, which doesn't seem to be again happening in the legislature, we would maybe uh, get better results than going after just guns. But that that's a political narrative that the governor and uh, certain interest groups have. Uh, they don't like guns. Uh, we Speaking of problems, uh, and this is HB 179, and I'm glad to report that this one does not seem to be going anywhere. This is the let's just tax everybody to address alcohol problems. Now, uh, I know it's it's shocking. This is going to blow your mind, Wally, but there may be some relationship between the issues driving New Mexico's alcohol abuse issues and our gun problems. And I'm not saying people getting drunk and going out and shooting people, although that's certainly a possibility. But I think the lack of care for oneself and one's neighbors and society at large and impulse control and some of these other issues and also the impression often for some good reasons that bad actions are not going to be punished in the state of New Mexico. Uh, so I got a hold of the fiscal impact report from the, the 25 cent per drink alcohol tax bill. And, uh, you know, to say that these are mind blowing or insane would be an understatement. So these are the good news is this bill doesn't seem to be going anywhere, but this was and remains a hotly contested issue in terms of raising alcohol taxes. So the current tax on beer is 41 cents a gallon. The new tax proposed under this uh, bill would be $3.08 per gallon, a 651% increase. Wine, 45 cents per liter is the current rate. Uh, the proposal is to go to $2.14 per liter, 376% increase. Uh, spirits, $1.60 per liter currently. Go to $7.24 per liter, a 353% tax increase. In cider, and uh, I'll throw this out there because I, I don't know that I've ever seen, and uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but we both follow the news reports fairly closely. I don't know that I've ever seen somebody get drunk off of cider and do any uh, damage to somebody else. Now, maybe they just don't break it down. I've never seen anybody or heard of anybody say an officer, I... Only had three ciders before I got on the road. Anyway, uh, without any further jokes, 41 cents per gallon going to $3.08 per gallon, 60, 651% increase. I guess ciders tax like beer in this state. So anyway, um, thankfully this doesn't look to be going anywhere, but uh, wow, those are some tax increases. There is no doubt about that, Paul. And it is interesting. Uh, and And I would say... There might be some impact on alcohol usage if they put six hundred percent tax increases there. It's interesting. This this is the first time in memory it seems like that uh, we've heard acknowledgement that we, well maybe a tax might if you make something more costly maybe you would use less of it. But the big question is uh, with this is that who is this going to impact? You know, is this the uh, is the social drinker going to drink less? Uh, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. Uh, what about the uh, person who is a, an abuser or, or, you know, an alcoholic? What's going to happen with them? And then uh, anytime you have a really high tax and you live in a place where that tax is just uh, on you but not in the state next door, are we going to see people going, uh, you know, particularly in places that are close to the border, Las Cruces, uh, Northern New Mexico, Eastern New Mexico. It's ironic that in Eastern New Mexico, we'd go from a formerly dry county to another formerly dry county to buy beer. But a lot of those things, uh, a lot of those things happen as well. And the magnitude of this is is truly stunning. You know, it's one of those we're talking seven dollars a liter. You know, a uh, for a, a bottle of booze, a bottle of booze that's five dollars more. Those are what seven hundred and fifty milliliters, roughly five dollars more. That that will show up, and you know, again, uh, it will catch, it will catch the intended targets. Will it make a difference with them? But it will certainly catch just the uh, the social drinker, the people who drink. And then finally, what's going to happen if uh, alcohol is so expensive? Uh, 
is there a substitution there? You know, it's like, uh, will we be, will we see a rise in fentanyl use, for example? And I'm not, I'm certainly not predicting that, and I'm absolutely, positively not hoping that. Right. But anytime you know you do things that are that are like this, and you've seen this with uh, with uh, cigarettes, there's some people that frankly cannot get off of cigarettes. It doesn't matter if they're legal; they'll just, they'll literally go to another state. Have their friend UPS them in from another state, things will happen. So, uh, you know, but the point is, is that in a record budget uh, surplus, let's just tax it. That's that's the thing we have going right now. And then the final point, we're going to put this money in a treatment fund. Right. Okay, anytime you hear we're going to dedicate this money for this purpose, that is worth zero. That's worth nothing. It's not binding on any future legislature, so it can happen right now. But there's been so many things. Uh, interestingly, uh, in the oil and gas industry, for example, we had an orphan well fund. You pay into that. Well, they spent it. So mm -hmm. they'll spend it where they want to spend it. And don't... don't. It's not in a lockbox? It is. Well, not it is in the proverbial <laughs> lockbox, the one that doesn't exist and can never hold funds for the future. But yeah, there's a there's a lot of issues with this, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. For I those of know. you who are oh, say under thirty or thirty five, uh, uh, look up Saturday Night Live when it was funny, and uh, Al Gore, um, Al Gore liked to talk about his his lockbox for Social Security, and uh, it was something he really said, unlike some of the other things that uh, Saturday Night Live tends to make fun of, but. Uh, Saturday Night Live was hysterical when they were talking about the lockbox, and I feel the same way about the paid sick leave or paid leave fund as well. That could be Im immensely problematic. But on the other hand, uh, think of all the Texas border jobs you could come up with. You could run your weed across the border to Texas and sell that there, and then fill up with a lot of booze on the way back to bring it to New Mexico. Now, totally illegal on both sides, but. Um, you know, it's only illegal if they catch you. Well, to quote the song from Smokey and the Bandit, eastbound and down, loaded up and trucking. So, yes, you could. Uh, the key to keep shipping costs low is to take something somewhere and then pick up something yeah. and come back. And, uh, Paul, I, all joking aside, uh, there are a lot of jobs that would be in New Mexico, but for our gross receipts tax and other things oh, yeah. are already in Texas. So is it too hard to believe that, that we would move some business of other kinds into Texas, not hard at all. So, the good news is that particular bill with those insane increases is not looking uh, like it's moving anywhere. However, other pieces of legislation with potential alcohol tax increases may move. And uh, if we really get to things rolling here, you know, tune in next week for sure. But uh, check heirsofenchantment.com. And we will make sure to alert folks uh, as these bills get traction if they do. Uh, hey, and Paul, one yep. other point I'd like to make. All of those uh, alcohol comments and the taxes comes from a person who doesn't drink. So <laughs> it's one of those. That's, uh, but I also know that prohibition doesn't seem like it works. And with a high enough tax, it's kind of a quasi-prohibition and some bad things could happen. So. Absolutely. Uh, one more uh, specific deal here with regard to the legislature. Uh, I happened to be up there on Wednesday evening, and they were debating the budget on the floor of the House. One of the things that we've discussed to some degree here in the uh, uh, in this session is the attempt by the governor to mandate the five day school week. A lot of rural districts wish for various reasons to go with four longer days ac accumulating enough hours to fill the requirements of the state but having that friday presumably as a off day giving a three-day weekend uh minimizing commuting times for children and teachers alike uh that is popular with rural communities, popular with the teachers, popular with the families, popular with the kids. So anyway, it's very popular, which only means that Governor Lujan Grisham wants to squash it by uh, she put $110 million in bud the budget. That's HB2. And uh, I went ahead and looked for the uh, vote because 
Gail Armstrong, uh, Representative Armstrong, offered an amendment to HB2 that uh, essentially prohibited funds in the budget from being used to mandate the five-day school week. Uh, she's somebody who's really led the charge on this particular issue. And uh, something that you don't see every day, a so-called hostile amendment to the budget, meaning it's uh, something that the uh, people who put that document together, who are Democrats, uh, wanted to put in there. And uh, the, the floor, there's a vote, a recorded vote, and the body as a whole on a 42 to 26 vote basis said, no, we, uh, we don't want the governor mandating five-day school weeks. We want to allow four-day school weeks if that is the choice. So, uh, you know, obviously that involves a lot of Democrats, predominantly rural area Democrats who crossed partisan lines. And uh, it, it was fairly dramatic as New Mexico's legislature gets uh, from an actual policymaking perspective. Uh, in fact, when Armstrong had clearly won the vote, she kind of looked around and uh, nobody really knew what to do because those are so rarely successful, those floor house votes in terms of changing what is actually in the bill. Uh, so, you know, we, uh, OAK, uh, NM, Opportunities for All Kids in New Mexico, Rebecca Dow, uh, working with the Rio Grande Foundation has been very active in this regard. We're not out of the woods yet. This is one provision in the budget by one of the two bodies, the House. The Senate has to still adopt its budget. Uh, we'll see if they uh, go along with the uh, limitation on these funds being used for a five-day school week. And then, of course, uh, Governor uh, Lujan Grisham could line-item veto any provision in the final budget as well. So Yeah, in in. Is it clear to you, Paul, that she might be able to do that? Because I know you can veto spending. Can you veto not spending? Well, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, and I has, have you ever known this governor to be <laughs> limited by nice and he's called Oh, no, you might, law. Ha you might have to take it to court to prove it one way or the other. But I, yeah. I'm, well, the first step is to have that provision uh, in the Senate. And I, it's a slim read. It's a thin read indeed, but... My belief at this point is that overall the house is slightly more, maybe maybe not even conservative, but they are slightly more willing to rock the boat and stand up to the governor than the Senate. The Senate is slower, which is obviously good for Republicans uh, and limited government folks, but the Senate tends to, when they vote, uh, be very limited and just the Republican numbers and the, the characters at play in the, in the Senate seem to be unable to, uh, you know, push back, uh, against this governor, generally speaking, but you know, we'll see what happens with the Senate vote on that or, uh, what happens in, in that body as well. Yeah. And, and you, you nailed it. There's a big urban rural divide on more and more and more policies uh, that are being attempted to be implemented in Santa Fe. And as I looked, as I looked at this issue, Paul, uh, the articles I read certainly didn't have enough data for me to say that, oh, this shows there's no impact. But there are plenty of districts that currently have four day school weeks that are doing very well achievement wise. So it, it doesn't mean that just because you have a four day school week uh, that you can't have a quality education and the converse, there are plenty of districts that have five day school weeks that are doing very, very poorly. So I'm not saying that uh, that's a reason to go there, but you know, uh, the uh, situation in rural New Mexico is a little bit different than it is here in Albuquerque and Las Cruces and Santa Fe. And, Maybe the policies will reflect that. Maybe they will. Yeah, and uh, just to be clear, we are not at the Rio Grande Foundation engaged in this discussion because we believe that uh, four-day school weeks are some kind of magic ticket to improved out outcomes educationally in New Mexico. That's simply, uh, you know, and, and on the flip side, the governor has very little leg to stand on to say that going to five-day school weeks will improve educational outcomes. Uh, we are philosophically, though, at the Rio Grande Foundation supportive of local control, and 
giving you know the control generally speaking as much as possible to those bodies that are actually in the community engaged in the process understanding what needs that uh, particular district has within reason and the governor wants of course her control and centralizing things in Santa Fe so uh, that's kind of the philosophical approach but yeah it's I, I think it's hard to say that uh, there is a correct answer there from a outcomes standpoint uh, four or five days a week uh, in terms of taxes and what I said before you know we're still waiting in the last big kind of policy area that we're going to be working on in the last several days of this session involves the tax omnibus bill this is the kind of bill that includes most of the tax policy with a 3.5 billion dollar surplus available we would expect some really bold policies but uh, then again you deal with this legislature and you realize that they are inept with regard to any economic policy so uh, we're very much waiting for that but it, we did check out a chart from the committee to unleash prosperity that we uh, posted at heirs of enchantment uh, 14 states started off this year 2024 with tax reductions uh, in their individual tax rates most of them, I assure you, did not have the kind of surplus that we have in New Mexico. Uh, they are Montana, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, Mississippi, Indiana, Kentucky, Ohio, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Connecticut, and New Hampshire. All of those states, and I guess New Hampshire because they're a zero income tax state. It had to be on the capital gains front, but that's still a form of income and that qualifies. So uh, the point is, is that... Um, you know, New Mexico is standing still. Uh, Christine Chandler uh, in a committee in uh, the House Tax Committee. Oh, man, this it, it, she should never be let anywhere near uh, tax policy or any economic policy. But she was just uh, quote. I was I was on the on the Zoom uh, listening to this committee and Christine Chandler, Democrat from Los Alamos said, we're still trying to recover from her the horrific Richardson tax cuts. Uh, so first and foremost, trashing her former uh, former governor and all-around great guy, as at least when he died, the Democrats certainly came out of the woodwork and made it seem like we'd lost a saint. Now, uh, Richardson, I thought, was policy-wise light years in front of uh, most current Democrats nationally and in New Mexico. But uh, boy, uh, that really highlights how far we've come. Yes, and uh, I guess by that extension, so uh, the what will bring prosperity to New Mexico is let's keep raising those taxes, raise the income tax, raise the gross receipts tax, raise all these other taxes. And uh, we've seen uh, some evidence, Paul, that that is not true. Uh, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> it's I know. amazing that there is evidence out there, but it does show that that is not necessarily true. So. I thought that businesses really enjoyed giving up a large fraction and workers. Oh, we're, uh, everyone large, enjoys giving yeah, money, to giving the money to the government. Yeah, that's it's, what we like. Um, I had an opinion piece that ran uh, in several papers across the state, just flagging it's available at areas of enchantment uh, on uh, the attacks on the oil and gas industry. Uh, this is the first time I think we've seen a real substantive uh, group of bills proposed doesn't mean they're going to pass but uh it is unique and i think this is um setting the table if you will for if we come back after november's election with another progressive legislature uh that the attacks on the oil and gas industry will pick up steam uh we we this election this uh november for all the legislators needs to uh, rein in the progressiveness of the uh, legislature in New Mexico, but uh, it's up to the voters. Uh, locally here in Albuquerque, uh, just under three years ago, uh, March of 2021, the city purchased a, a property on the west side, not too far from my house, so I walk my dogs by this place all the time, known as the Pool Estate. Since then, it has sat vacant, collecting graffiti and uh, generally becoming uh, a bit of an eyesore. And uh, I mean, this is beautiful property down uh, east of Coors, 
nearby the river uh, in a very, I would call it, uh, you know, high end area within Albuquerque. And uh, this plot of land was built to or was uh, bought to be open space. Uh, you know, just I, I know that they really bought it because there was somebody who was going to come in and build houses on there and they simply did not want that. But uh, it, this this all gets into, you know, federal land management and why government should be limited, strictly limited in the amount of land and the uses of that land. If there's a defined purpose and you're building a park and you've got a plan to build a park or whether it's national park or something else, that's one thing. If you're just buying the land because you don't want somebody to do something you don't like with it, that is a bad idea. And I think that's where things happened. And uh, who knows? We'll, we'll see how long this property just sits vacant. Yeah. And then, Paul, uh, to say we have some competing policy objectives, it's like, heaven forbid, they would have bought that land and built houses on it. Don't we want more uh, houses and uh, more homes here in New Mexico and in Albuquerque in particular? We say we do, but Maybe not right here. Maybe somewhere else. I'm not sure. Oh, the NIMBY forces uh, run rampant. And uh, we saw that a while back. Boy, you know, it was a county commissioner, I believe, Debbie O'Malley. And it was uh, land that they uh, were going to build over by, uh, I think, off of Osuna. There was going to be a uh, a Walmart. And uh, neighbors and everybody got up in arms. And uh, they wound up buying it and making a, quote, unquote, balloon landing site. Yeah. That was a that was the excuse that time. It's just the government has too much money. Uh, it it obviously is geared towards the the squeaky wheel in some respects, and unfortunately, in this state in this town, the squeakiest wheel is not uh, seemingly the business wheel or the wheel of people demanding that we diversify our economy in a in a market based direction. It's uh, you know I don't want a Walmart near my house, or I don't want housing built in my neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, finally, last on the docket, uh, there was an issue discussed in the national media, and by that, that I mean uh, Yahoo Finance, uh, that even we were surprised about with regard to electric vehicles. And apparently the study came out saying that uh, the guardrails all over our nation's roads cannot stop, cannot contain electric vehicles from pushing through those barriers, that's because, of course, uh, those EVs weigh between 20 and 50% more than gas-powered vehicles, and they also happen to have a low center of gravity, which means that they apparently, when they lose control at a high speed, just break on through those uh, steel guardrails. And I don't know, you know how much money it would cost to replace all the guardrails across the country I'm sure it would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars, though. But on the other side, if you're driving an electric vehicle in the mountainous areas of New Mexico and you make one wrong turn, uh, good luck with those guardrails saving you from plummeting to the bottom of the mountain. And, uh, you know, that's that's a real concern as well. Or more importantly, you know, we have these uh, four lane divided roads that are just divided by guardrails. And uh, if an electric vehicle loses control and goes across the oncoming traffic, that could be a huge tragedy as well. So serious uh, concerns there with electric vehicles. And even as skeptical as I am about EVs, that was not something that previously had crossed my mind. No, uh, no doubt about it. And uh, the fact that they're heavy is uh, starting to come up in lots of different places. Those batteries are heavy and uh, the mass is high and uh, just one more area. So we've seen... uh, tires, uh, we've seen road wear, and now, heaven forbid, guardrails. Yeah, and I, I think it's safe to say that if we had these kinds of issues with a gas technology, some other technology that wasn't so uh, politically connected or politically the darling right now, that there would be investigations from NTSB and uh, other bodies, but EVs are, are extra special, and uh, so they may cause all these problems, <coughs> but those problems will be allowed to slide until something truly bad happens and we can't ignore it. All right, thanks for listening to this week's episode. Find all episodes at tippingpointsnm.com or at the Rio Grande Foundation's YouTube channel. 
Subscribe to the show at Apple, Stitcher, or tell Google Home to play Tipping Point New Mexico. Thanks to Path3 Marketing for producing this show.